Now, live from the capital city, Georgetown. Politico, legislative, economics, and current affairs. The People's National Congress Reform, PNCR, presents Nation Watch. Nepotism to stop cronyism. Vote APNU AFC. Good day to you, Guyana, and welcome to Facing the Nation. I am Malika Ramsey. Thank you very much for joining us for another what promises uh, to be another informative week. As we're just about, well, it's the 10th of April, so we're just about a month away from uh, the 2015 regional and general elections for Guyana. Now, one of the things that would be on your mind, this is apart from the manifestos coming from the various parties, of course, is the list. And whether your friends, your relatives, uh, whether your own names are on the list or not, and I know some of you have... Uh, been panicking a bit but I have two gentlemen here today who will tell you why you should not panic and you know exactly what it is that the APNU AFC coalition will uh, do to sort of ensure uh, ensure you that you don't necessarily have to panic regarding uh, our list that concerns have obviously been expressed even by our own presidential candidate Brigadier the Honorable David Granger. Um, I'll introduce the two gentlemen now of course neither of them are strangers to our program beginning with Dr. Rupert Rupnarain who is one of the executive uh, members in the partnership and in the coalition. Welcome sir. Good to have you. Thank you. And of course, Mr. David Patterson, who is the General Secretary for the Alliance for Change, and he is also one of the executive members in the APNU AFC coalition. Welcome, sir. Welcome, welcome. All right. Great to have you gentlemen both. I know you have your statements to make uh, in terms of letting the population know exactly what it is that APNU AFC will be doing uh, to, in a sense, keep an eye on our uh, electoral list. But first of all, at this point in time, what should Guyanese be doing? Before you tell us what you're going to do, what should Guyanese be really be doing at that when we're just about a month away from elections to ensure that their names are on those lists? And if not, you know, where they can go to query to raise their issues? Well, I think that what people need to be doing is taking the question of looking at the list to ensure their names are on quite seriously. And of course, uh, you know, getting, getting ready for election day itself and to ensure that they go out and vote early, they know where they have to go to vote, and to ensure orderliness on election day. We are doing our work in relation to the list, and I, th I think David is going to explain some of what it is we are doing. But your caution that people should not be panicking about the list is well taken. The fact of the matter is that we have a duty as political parties contesting the election to make sure that the list is you know, as, as regular and as um, proper uh, as it can be. Um, I think that there are some things when the list first appeared that to all at, at first blush, I mean, needed explanation. We need to have an explanation about some rises in terms of the number of electors and that kind of thing. We are taking that quite seriously. 
and we are conducting a due diligence exercise to ensure that we can, you know, assist uh, and, and get the list in a, a state of, of readiness. But we must point out, as we have pointed out this morning to the press, that the, the duty to get the um, list of electors in, in order is really uh, GCOM's, GCOM's business. Okay. And um, we were heartened, I think, to hear that the EAB is going to be working um, with GCOM to uh, assist in relation to ensuring the, uh, the list is everything that it should be. We, of course, as I said this morning, we are prepared and stand ready to assist the EAB in any of its work mm -hmm. um, because essentially we will be doing much of the same thing. They will presumably be taking their own sample, which they will check. We are taking our sample. And if we combine our activities, we should get a good spread in relation to verification. All right. Before we so before I come to uh, Mr. Patterson and exactly what is, um, in, in terms of specifics, if you can give that what's being done, um, the presidential candidate, APN, UAFC presidential candidate, would have raised some issues a few weeks ago while he was in the diaspora regarding that same list. Is your uh, quote unquote keen watch on this list now coming because of those concerns you would have raised or would have or would measures been in place would have been in place before to uh, watch the list carefully well, we have been watching the list I mean mm -hmm. you know the fact of the matter is we use the claims and objection period mm -hmm. which was the opportunity to you know to, to go in and, and ensure that the electors on the list are, are bona fide electors um, but notwithstanding all the work we did in the claims objection period, the list has appeared and there are, you know, frankly more electors than um, had been expected. But we need to ensure that those electors who are there, um, you know, there, obviously there are instances where there are people on the list who are no longer here, that people were probably here for, uh, for registration and then they have gone to live wherever it is they live and so on. So it is quite possible that list is in fact um, you know inflated to the extent that not all electors can be found at the present time mm -hmm. that these are the things we have to verify um, but as I say we are not uh, overly we're not overly anxious in relation to it all I think when the list first came out with the figures that came out people looked a little bit askance uh, how did this happen um, how could you have such an increase from the 2011 list to the 2015 list? And people have been working on that, and there are a lot of people who I should say are skilled in relation to understanding the census figures and the relationship of the census figures to the final vote of the electors, uh, the list of electors, and so on. And we are paying attention to all of those uh, analyses. Um, Dr. Rubnarain, the currently as we speak, I know they would have raised, um, a month ago they would have raised some issues, but currently as we speak, the PVP does not seem to be as watchful or has uh, concerned uh, as APNU AFC is regarding the list. Is that worrying in any way, worrying uh, for the opposition coalition? Well, I would be surprised if the PPP as a responsible political party is approaching an election and does not want itself to verify that the list is everything it ought to be. I can't speak for what it is they're doing or not doing in relation to the list. I have to say that in their regular briefings with the press and so on, I have not heard Mr. Rohi voicing any particular concerns. And that does not necessarily mean they don't have concerns and okay. they're not working at it. I, I have no way of knowing. Okay, all right. Mr. Patterson, now, on specifics as to how we're going to, and, and I say we here because I think sometimes people forget that I'm also a part of AP and AFC. How is it that we're going to achieve watching this list keenly between now and uh, come May 11th, May 12th? Ah. Uh, good afternoon, Nika. Um, just before I get to that, um, mm -hmm. you, one of the things you asked, um, I want to follow up on what Dr. Rupinine said about what people can do. It's important that you actually not only check that your name's on the list, check where you are going to vote. Because okay. um, some people would have registered and they would change their place of residence and if they haven't um, done a transfer, mm -hmm. they may not be voting and where they actually live means if you mm. registered in Lodge and you're now living in um, somewhere South Cummingsburg, um, what we find on election day, people go to the nearest polling base station where they're actually living, not realizing that they should be where they registered. And, uh, and then there a lot of um, you know, I mean, suspicion is raised that, that your name are, is off the list when you actually should be voting where your name is. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to you not only ensure your name is in the list, ensure what? which polling 
station and the division you are in. I if I could just jump in here on that same point uh, uh, quickly. So is it just for clarity, the viewers' clarity, is it, are, are you saying that if you voted uh, at polling station X in 2011 um, and you're still living the same place, yeah. is it a possibility that you won't necessarily be voting at that polling no. station? No. If, if you are voted at polling station X in 2011 and you're mm -hmm. still living in the same place, you're you will, you will, to be able to you will vote where mm -hmm. you are registered. But Understood. if you've moved, mm -hmm. um, you, it's not ne and, and unless you did a transfer to a new to a new um, place of residence, mm -hmm. you will have to you will obviously have to vote back where um, you were registered. And you voted the last time. And another issue which I wanted to raise and which I think um, at the coalition will will broach with GCOM to be very more specific is the question of ID cards. First, I want to say it out there: I think seventy five thousand ID cards uncollected, and therefore you've registered and your name is on the list. But due to some circumstances I, um, at the moment, you, you have not your ID card, please do so. You have, uh, what do you say, a month to do so. Yes. However, not being in possession of an ID card does not disenfranchise you from voting. Right. And this we would like people to know that. I mean, do not think that you don't have an ID card, you haven't been able to uplift your ID card because you were out of tongue and those things. Like that. You can still vote. Um, and I'm saying this particularly because we've been uh, people. There is a wild rumor being circulating that um, um, a certain political organization is buying ID cards, mm -hmm. right? The actual. And I'm, and I'm not subscribing any, if that's any true or not. I just want to tell people: even if so, if you think so, you can still vote. If ah, somebody sold their sold ID it, card, can stay, yeah. they can still vote. You know what I mean? I'm not advocating anyone sell the ID card. Don't Honestly, want to yes. make that perfectly clear. Um, getting down to specifics on the list, what the Alliance, the, the Joint Team Unity is doing at the moment is we have isolated the 83,000 persons that would have entered the list since 2011. New the new registrants. New, the new registrants. Okay. Um, we're working on, on the assumption that the 2011 list was uh, arose out of a uh, house house registration mm -hmm. and we're examining doing a sampling of the 83,000 in the different regions whereby we, we said we're sending in persons to physically a random sample physically check um, and, and that's similar to what EAB is doing physically check to identify um, these okay. 83,000 persons um, and then when we get that re um, re report back in from our fields we can make a determination um, on where we go forward. Um, it should be known that all this, the list that, that, that is available now is, just, is not the official list. The official list probably comes out, I think, in um, uh, 30 days after nomination day or something like that. So there is um, an area, an element for, for it which we can take. If, when that list comes out, um you the final, the official the final, list, yeah. final list. Would that be enough window period, enough time for well, adjustments to be made? No, well, the adjustments have to be made now. No. Right? Mm -hmm. We have boots on the ground, as they were saying, goal. We have boots on the ground currently. We're putting more boots on the ground. I mean, it's all targeted on scientific basics. Um, certain regions have priorities because they're far from and their border regions and those things like that. Um, so we're looking at that. We're working on the way out, coming back into center. Um, so we will have our due diligence process completed way before the, coalition, the official list comes out. All right. Um, viewers, if you're now joining us, of course, this is Facing the Nation. Uh, if you, you would note that we did it a little different. Uh, we do have a feature for you uh, this week. As you know, recently, the presidential candidate for APNU AFC declared at the parade ground that he has a love for women. So a little later on in the program, I have a clip uh, to show you more in detail, uh, he, he's talking about exactly what it is that he meant by that and exactly what it is that APNU AFC will do for women uh, beginning May 12, 2015. So you can look forward to that a little later on in the program. As you know, this is election season and these two gentlemen are very, very busy like so many uh, other members of the coalition. They have to get from one appointment to the next. So we did it that way so I can relieve uh, the gentleman a little earlier. So unfortunately, I won't be taking your calls. I 
know you have a lot of questions, probably questions that I haven't thought about regarding the list and so on, but I promise you as we move closer into the season, not only this program, but we have several programs on various channels uh, where you will get an opportunity to pose those questions and concerns that you may have. At the same time too, you can also visit our office at Queens. Uh, that's in Queenstown, Krong and Albert Streets, where there's always somebody there who can, you know, take your questions. And even if we can't answer them, we forward it to uh, our seniors. Gentlemen, now let's talk about election day of itself, because mm -hmm. that is something else that people also worry about. You did uh, explain your plan throughout the entire season leading up to election day, but how, one, what systems are in place to monitor all these polling stations on election day, and how is it that the public at large can help us to monitor these stations and ensure that everything is legit? Well, um, like what one of the things is the each political party contesting the elections are entitled to have a scrutineer mm -hmm. who is our representative to um, scrutinize the process during election time, mm -hmm. as well as be there while we're counting the ballots at the final. Mm -hmm. So the alliance has started, I think, is is um, led by Ms. Amna Ali and team, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Clayton Hall, um, and they have started training persons individually in every single region. We, so far to date, um, the last list I saw, that we do have a full complement of scrutineers. Um, however, we're taking it the, even further. We're, we're now doing a second tier, um, a second backup for critical areas. I mean, if someone falls ill on the day or any, or anything, any mishaps, we would have an immediate substitute. Um, so what? So we will be, we'll be scrutinizing every single process uh, as well. You know, I mean, we want um, one with the public as well. They they can also help us in the sense they know their communities. You know, I mean, you're allowed to stay. I think 200 yards away from a polling booth, you can sit down there, you can go around encourage your people to come and vote, you know I mean, you can have a list of elected, you can tick them off. Mm. And you can actually go and visit families that you know are within the, your polling district that, that you haven't seen, then sure they vote, you know what I mean, and of course vote appropriately. All right. Our people with vehicles sure. can assist people to the polling mm -hmm. station. All right. So and there's a lot of work the public can do on election day to assist the party. And right. just before, sure. sorry, sorry sure. Think, mm -hmm. proxies. Ah, I that's I what want, I was coming I to. If you have a family member who is infirm and will not be able to physically get to the polling station, mm -hmm. you should start con think considering applying for proxy for them. To apply for proxy, all it is you have to um, someone that is voting the same polling station as the person that um, mm -hmm. cannot make it. You should come into the offices either at um, in Queenstown. Uh, Queenstown. There's you can go to Commerce Place. You can come to the AFC office and indicate to us that you have someone in your um, your household um, who will need assistance, who will need a proxy voting. And you should do so early um, so that, that, if, that we can have the process uh, finally. So there will be persons monitoring those uh, persons who will be voting by proxy? Well, be, well, well, what, what, what happens is that the GCOM, when we put in the application, GCOM mm -hmm. will visit the person, confirm oh, okay. that they cannot uh, uh, right. make it to the polling station, and then they will say, fair enough, they'll ask them, who do you want to be a proxy, I say Rupert. Rupert is voting, so therefore at, at, the, at the time the Rupert will be given two ballots because and he because he has the proxy sheet. And they, ha they, ha they must have the same last name? No, 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 must no, vote no. The, they must vote, the only criteria is they should be voting the same polling, polling station, station as the person that they're voting for. That's right. Right? right. Last name, surname, whatever that's it is. Right. Just that. So there will be 300 electors in your polling station. Mm -hmm. One of those 300 electors um, can for you. All right. Um, gentlemen, you, you specifically, uh, it's really unfortunate that I have to bring this up because it's, it's uh, distasteful and really unnerving. In 2011, on election day of itself, gentlemen, we would have gotten some reports. Of course, this would have been before the um, coalition. We would have gotten some reports on election day of itself that persons were at various polling stations pulling ballot boxes and fighting and these kind of things. And I'm going to call a name here because, uh, for example, the, the press lays on to the president, uh, Kwame McCoy, was allegedly, uh, was accused of allegedly being one of the persons pulling those uh, ballot boxes. People are concerned because he has portrayed a character of bullyism over the, the, the past years. And people are, unfortunately, people are afraid of him. 
not only him but things like that how what how are you going to advise people working at the polling stations to deal with that kind of situation well i mean this matter was raised this morning it's a security issue mm -hmm. Um, we are not in a position to field security officers. That's the ah. business of the police. Mm -hmm. But what we have to ensure is that all of this activity, um, you know, I, I don't want to use up our very precious year mm. time discussing Kwame McCoy. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that any kind of violent, untoward, or thuggish behavior on election day uh, should be deplored and should be in effect. Uh, dealt with in terms of the discipline services. I mean, they are the people who have responsibility for order on election day, and we expect them to exercise their authority to ensure that citizens who want to peacefully vote mm -hmm. can do so. We would like an election day that is absolutely free of thuggery or free of violence, free of bullying. That is not what we need. We would like, after all of the work that has gone forward, we would like an election day where people can go and cast their vote in peace and quiet so that we can, in effect, you know, demonstrate the popular will in a civilized way. This is what we in APNU are asking and should happen. Okay. Yes. yes, perfect. I want to echo um, Dr. Rupert Ryan's statement. You know, I mean, um, we've had all an incident-free mm -hmm. um, election process so far mm -hmm. from the, the Alliance, the, the Unity team. We were at WIM, there was no issue. We were mm -hmm. in SQ Quibble, there's no issue. We were in Georgetown, there's no issue, you know what I mean? Um, our major lawn, we were in Linden without any issues, you know what I mean? And I'd like to congratulate everyone for that. And I'd ask to encourage mm -hmm. you to continue mm -hmm. acting with restraint, you know what I mean? I would, I would even go so bold to say this is our elections to lose. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can lose it is by dropping the ball. It's, 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 they are going to do things to incite us, mm -hmm. right? They are going to do things um, that to provoke you to respond. I urge everybody to restrain because obviously it only mean we, we, we have things in place to ensure right, that the will of the people right, will record a victory for team unity in, on May the 11th. So you know, I mean, just maintain focus, just maintain the, your calm, be, stay focused, don't take your eye off the ball. Gentlemen, unfortunately, there are some <laughs> naive persons in society, and not only naive, people have uh, gotten caught up in the everyday activity, day-to-day -day life, that sometimes they believe the silliest things. There is this still, still this thing being peddled out there that the PPP can know we right vote. We all know that that's not true, but I'd just like to give you gentlemen an opportunity just to uh, convince persons, especially young persons who are first-time voters, that look, even if you're afraid, the PPP can't possibly know how you voted. Well, one of the things that we want to ensure is that, um, for instance, one of the things we heard was that um, people carry in their cell phones in the polling station and then you have to take a photograph of your ballot paper so you can show people how you voted. Cell phones are not allowed in polling stations. They have to be left outside. You cannot go in there with, with your cell phone to do anything. My, my concern is really that you know, the fear factor mm. and the intimidation factor, that kind of thing. I have no doubt that it's there in the society. And um, we all know that there are people, some people in the society in positions of authority who have a, a, a penchant, a tendency for intimidation and that kind of thing. As David said, you know, we have to be very mature come election day. We have to ensure that we do not you know, we, we resist any attempt to provoke. There will be provocation. I have no doubt in my mind there will be provocation. And there will be intimidation, there will be people who are trying to frighten you, look, if you vote so and so, this one will know or that one will know, and people are watching the polling stations. The polling is secret. When you are with, you are in the, in the actual, you know, polling booth, facing the booth, you are there carrying out a civic duty in complete secrecy and security. You are free to vote as you wish. And you should not go in there harboring some, you know, some, you know, anticipation, some fear that your vote will become known and you will be victimized. Do not let them frighten anybody that this can happen. They have no way of knowing how you voted. So 
people should go forward and exercise their food. Mm -hmm. okay. on, this, on this, I want to say very quickly um, that one of the things that we are concerned about, and we are deeply concerned about it, is the fact that yesterday at their meeting, GCOM decided against the um, issuing of certificates of employment. Now, certificates of employment have been since, I believe, the 1997 elections and exactly when they started. Mm -hmm. But in, in those elections and subsequent elections, certificates of employment are issued to party polling agents and polling officials who may be assigned to polling stations that are outside of their own uh, districts and, and, and somewhere other than where they would normally vote. So they, through a certificate of employment, can vote in the polling station to which they have been deployed. So any action that, in effect, uh, says, look, we will not be issuing certificates of employment, I believe is an act of disenfranchisement. And GCOM should not be in the business of disenfranchising voters. They should be in the business of enfranchising every single elector. So we have a concern about that. And we will be approaching the Guyan Elections Commission in relation to this decision. Because we, I know that in 2011, that we spent a great deal of time because for most of the day certificates of employment were not being issued and late in the day we got them to agree that some would be they would be issued they were then issued in uh, a manner that was completely unsatisfactory but we want to ensure that these certificates of employment are issued i mean gcom has a statutory duty under the laws of Guyana to remove any difficulty that electors may have in relation to exercising their ballot. They, 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 cannot, they cannot sit there and say, look, these polling agents um, are not going to be allowed to vote, which is essentially what they're saying. Mm -hmm. What it does is that it hampers the political parties, the APNU and uh, uh, AFC coalition, it hampers us in relation to where we put particular polling, polling agents. We may decide, look, this is a hard case polling station, and we want to put in somebody who can deal with a hard case polling station, who can deal with possible intimidation mm -hmm. and so on. That may not be possible for somebody who comes from the immediate vicinity or the exactly. immediate community who is more open to being victimized mm -hmm. than the person we would otherwise put. So you cannot impose, first of all, on the political parties that kind of restriction in terms of who they would want to appoint to a polling station. And you certainly cannot be in the business of taking away the right to vote from polling agents who are electors. Are they likely to heed your advice? Well, all we can do is go and insist on, on, on what we do. We I, will I, give it our best I, effort. I don't oh, want to anticipate absolutely. what oh. they will do or not do. All right. They had a big discussion about this at GCOM. And um, there was talk even of GCOM two weeks ago, there was talk of GCOM approaching the courts for a ruling on whether or not they had the authority to do this. Um, well, you know, the courts are there. And I don't want to reach the point where we have to approach the courts to, mm -hmm. and, you know, sue a mandamus or something to get GCOM to act in the way that they're supposed to act. I'm hoping that we can persuade GCOM that this decision they've taken is not one that we, we can tolerate. Seems that uh, approaching the courts for the last uh, three years has become part of our culture, unfortunately. Um, gentlemen, before I have to let you go back to your uh, very busy schedule, there is propaganda being peddled out there. Of course, this has nothing to do with the list, but I'd like both of you to respond and to give the, 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 the voting population some hope. The PPP continues to peddle uh, propaganda indicating that, uh, referring to, and I raised this question in a previous program I had, they keep referring to a past failed uh, coalition, and they also talked about hardships that can possibly befall Guyana uh, if, uh, well, well, I should say when, when uh, the APNU AFC coalition gets into government. How do you convince people that that will not happen? Well, you know, it is very transparent what is going on. The PPP wants to drag us back into a past that most of the young voting population have no idea about. I mean, you know, the, the, the new young voters, they want to hear about the future. They want to hear about now. They want to hear about the, you know, the education system that is collapsing around them. They want to hear about jobs. 
the, these are things you want to hear about. They don't want to hear about what happened 40 years ago to somebody. I mean, this is, a, a, to my mind, a, a, a really a sign of a certain kind of bankruptcy on the part of the PPP. If this is the best they can do in relation to an election campaign to take us back to campaign against Mr. Burnham. Mr. Burnham has been dead long ago and mm. he's, Short years you know, yeah. and, and leave the man in peace. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to be, you, you mean, let, let me be a bit more frank then. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. The PPP cannot campaign on anything else, right? Other than the past, and then they try to wedge our, our people against each other by, by uh, raising up some old zombies that, you know, I mean, should allow to, to, to rest peacefully. Yes. You know, I mean, they can't campaign on what they've done. Um, they have 22 years to try and do it, and if you can't get it done in 22 years, I mean, there's no possible way to you, you get it done in the 23rd. Um, they can't campaign on that, that um, security. You know, I mean, every day you pick up, I mean, I heard Brigadier Green just say that there's a murder every eight hours. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get to sleep tonight and you wake up, somebody in it, and you know, the land has been murdered. Education, you speak about youths, unemployment, and you can go down the line, you yep. know what I mean? Um, they they can't even campaign on their mega projects that they've done. Skeldon um, Estate is a millstone around all the, 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 the sugar industry and every cane harvester, you know what I mean? And you can go Marriott, you know what I mean? You can they can't campaign on the, 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 the Marriott, you know what I mean? No, nobody wants to invest in that. Can't campaign on dental care, you know what I mean? It's, you know what I mean? People are abusing that. So the only thing that they can do is to try and drag us in a past where that is long gone, you know what I mean? And I don't know who would want to believe that, that, that myself, Rupert, you um, will go into a new government and instead of trying to make it better, mm. consider things like banning rights, uh, banning <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, come on. In that kind of, ridiculous. It, 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 I mean, come yeah. on, you mean, you mean, in this day and age, you know what I mean? How will, uh, come on, it, 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 it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. But they're so bankrupt, right? Yeah. They're, I mean, uh, they say, to, you know, I mean, a drunk man clutches a straw. Yes. Uh, so these are just the two straws that they can clutch up. So um, folks expect that. Expect that. I mean, I mean, I mean. Every time they raise it, you simply ask, "Well, you had a chance to to make a difference. You haven't, right? Why? Um, why, why should we not? vote for you? I mean, and that's it. All right. Uh, I just want to make one quick point before we go, sure. Micah. We are the ones who are fighting for an enlargement of democracy. Mm -hmm. And that is why the holding of local government elections is very high on our agenda, very early in the life of the new government. Because one of the ways in which we can you know, empower our citizens throughout the country in their communities is through the holding of local government elections. You know, we have no interest in restricting democra democracy in the country. This is, not, this is not the aim of the coalition. The aim of the coalition is to expand democracy and to make life better for the vast majority of our people. To, you know, to deal with this, this widening gap between the extremely wealthy and the very poor. These are the things that we are fighting against and we want to ensure that we have a society where the wealth of our nation is equitably distributed and our young people can look forward to a country in which they can live safely, harmoniously and productively. This is, this is what we're about. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I know you have to go. If you have nothing else to add, um, I, I, I think that we the have lots public... To add, yes, we, but, yeah, we you just can't add today. Yes, but yes. I, I know that the public is certainly grateful for the information yes. that you gave today. And I just, um, I just want to sure. close. Mm -hmm. I, I want to mean, I, I really want to close on, uh, I mean, once again, on congratulating our, our, our mm -hmm. supporters and how they have been carried themselves. It's beyond my wildest dream, I'm sure, Rupert, yes. I mean, the first thing that I mean the, the nomination day, mm. we had a I mean I, the people estimated ten thousand to fifteen thousand people up in mm -hmm. They behaved. There was a concern that city hall would collapse, collapse and uh -huh. those things like that. I mean, our supporters said, "Fair enough, we keep city hall up just by the will and the mm -hmm. earth." And they stood there and they <laughs> chanted and they sang and city hall stood up. You know, I mean, so I want to congratulate you, um, mm -hmm. everyone, on that behavior. And I yeah. encourage you, just. Keep the vision for another, um, what is it, 
31 days. Yes, yes. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not much. We can do it. And you just said the will of the people. So yeah, they the have the willpower. Yes, 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 yes. All mm -hmm. right. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, thank of you course, much. Dr. Rupert Rupnarain. And he is a leader of the, the Working People's Alliance, of course, a member of a partnership for national unity. He's an executive member in the APNU AFC uh, coalition. And of course, Mr. David Patterson, who is the general secretary for Alliance for Change and also an executive member in APNU AFC coalition. We'll take a break. Here is where we'll take a break. I'll allow the gentleman to go and I'll come right back with you on more, with more on Facing the Nation. Stay tuned. nepotism to stop cronyism vote apnu afc thanks for staying with us uh, those of you who are now joining us uh, you've missed a, a lot uh, i was really it was really really good to hear from dr rupert rubnarain and mr david patterson regarding what's happening with the list i know some of you uh have concerns out there what's happening with our electoral list and you heard it from the gentlemen themselves they are prepared and measures have already been put in place to watch the the list of electors keenly from now until may 11th well actually until may 12th because all day uh, may 11th is election day and that's the day we want you to go out and we want you to vote solidly for a partnership for national unity alliance for change because that is the coalition that will provide a better life for you that's the, the the government that will provide a good life for all Guyanese not the PPPC government that we would have been exposed to for the past 23 years that has brought us nothing but misery and pain and on that note a particular group in society that would have experienced extreme misery and pain under the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration is that of our women. Men always say, men often say actually, that women are the backbone of our society. And it's not just a saying, it is true. The fact is, a man cannot give birth. Under no circumstances can a man give birth. So without women, we wouldn't have a society. And recently, uh, that's on nomination day earlier this week, the Brigadier, Brigadier David Granger, who is the presidential candidate for a Partnership for National Unity, Alliance for Change, declared uh, to much cheering and fanfare declared to the crowd that he loves women and when the brigadier says that he loves women that means that himself and team will do everything possible to protect the women of our nation again something that the people's progressive party civic has not done for the past 23 years and there are lots of examples i mean i know ppp supporters out there will argue that look um there are uh, various government ministers and, and, and prominent females in the PPPC. But the fact is, that's just a handful, and it's less than a handful. And they clearly, obviously, they do not care for the ordinary man, for the ordinary uh, women out there. So now you'll hear from Brigadier as to how is it that his team will provide for the women in our society. Take a look at this interview I did with him yesterday. And of course, we'll come back right back. Stay with us. 
week we're focusing on a very very important issue women of course you know women are very very important to our nation and at a recent rally the brigadier did declare his love for women in general and he spoke about all the good things that APNU AFC will do uh, come May 12th that's after the elections what they will do for the women of our nation but before we even talk about that brigadier first off in the past uh, decade, the past two decades actually, have you seen uh, women progressing under the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration? In general, no. Women are the largest part of the population, but I think they're the poorest part of the population. And after more than two decades of PPP administration, I think that is still the same situation, that they're still the poorest part of the population um, in relative terms. I've seen increasing poverty among women, among young mothers, among um, persons who are confined to menial or manual work. And I would say no, um, there are a few prominent uh, persons. Uh, there are women ministers, there are women in law, there are women um, in many of the professions. But I would say that generally speaking, um, women have not progressed at the rate we expected them to progress. Don't forget that uh, the People's National Congress reform introduced uh, uh, white paper and women over 40 years ago. And I don't believe that what I see today reflects 40 years of progress. Certainly over the last two decades, progress has been very slow and poverty has incre increased for most of our, most Guyanese women. Was this intentional by the PPPC? Because you did say that, yes, there are um, prominent uh, females in our society, including ministers. But is it the case where the PPP does not want women to progress, or is it that they do not know how to get this achieved? It's about, the, it's about being um, careless. They don't care, really, um, whether women do well or not. Um, that is the problem. If they did care, there'd be more attention to poverty at the household level. And this is where um, women suffer most. The high cost of living confines the bulk of the female, the women population to poverty. I've been around all 10 regions of this country. And I would say that it's the woman who is the, uh, who's got the responsibility to bring up the children. And very frequently, um, too frequently sometimes in Guyanese society, they're single mothers, single parents. And it means that they must go to find work to get food for their children. But if we look at the cost of living, the value added tax, the cost of transportation, the cost of basic foods, um, the cost of getting children to school, the cost of bringing up children, the cost of medical care, you see that um, women are hurt first and they're hurt the hardest by the oppressive living conditions in Guyana today. You just talked about the cost of living. Let's touch a bit on security because I know you're also very passionate about that. How has the lack of security in our country affected women? Well, there's no doubt that domestic violence affects women most. Um, there is a, uh, a widespread fear of uh, crime in Guyana. Um, there's no narco trafficking, there is um, gun running. But I think at the level of the household, at the level of the community, we cannot ignore the fact that too many widows in their 70s have been raped and murdered. Too many young girls have been raped and murdered. Um, in the families themselves, there's incest, there's um, brutality, uh, and women are frequently the victims. Unfortunately, when women do not uh, have uh, professions or employment of their own, they are forced to stay in abusive relationships with men. The police force has not been trained, does not been equipped to deal with the huge surge in uh, domestic violence that we have here. I've recommended uh, on previous occasions that we have more female police officers who can deal sympathetically with these cases. So sometimes the indicators are there in a the community. You have neighborhood policing, you have community policing, but some or the other, the police force does not seem to notice the signals to prevent um, abuse, abuse which sometimes leads to murder. So I would say that um, much more has to be done uh, at the level of the state to protect our women. Women are our child bearers. Um, if we don't protect the women, society will suffer. Before we go on to solutions from an a, a possible APNU, AFC administration, PPP propagandists out there might want to say that you can't necessarily uh, blame the government, the top brass, for what happens in these communities or sometimes what happens in the homes regarding uh, domestic violence and domestic abuse. How do you respond to that? 
Well, in a sense you can't, but in another sense you can because you're looking at the political culture, you're looking at the law enforcement culture. And if we had a political culture which uh, celebrates womanhood, celebrates motherhood in a serious way, um, not only by passing laws, but by enforcing those laws. If we had a police force that is trained to deal sympathetically, for example, it is well known that most cases of rape are not brought to justice. And even those that are brought to justice, the conviction rate is very low. There have been numerous cases of rape murders in this country, which have never been thoroughly investigated. The crimes have never been solved. Sometimes, even in the case of gang rape, it's difficult to understand how you can have a gang rape in a place like Port Morant and not discover a single perpetrator. Uh, so the law enforcement definitely has to be, uh, the law enforcement apparatus definitely has to be improved to ensure that people who suffer from sexual crimes um, don't have to suffer twice. You know, they don't have to go on the street and see somebody who, is, uh, who has violated them. That the law must ensure that persons who commit these crimes are, uh, are punished in accordance with the law. Why, in talking about women and the plight of women in the, the last two decades, again, we see there are always uh, ministers, PPP, female ministers. These ministers have somehow, in most cases of atrocities committed on women, they've somehow managed to stay, stay style, silent. Why do you believe that happens? Well, it is perhaps the culture of denial which is present in the PPP. I had the experience myself two years ago when I brought a motion to investigate trafficking in persons. And the PPP ministers, including female ministers, seemed to feel that um, the victims of trafficking were making a lifestyle choice. That it really wasn't uh, trafficking, it really was some form of prostitution. And that is responsible for the attitude Instead of eradicating the crime of trafficking in person, there is a culture of tolerance. There are no proper centers um, to deal with the victims um, when, they are, uh, when they are rescued from their plight in the hinterland or wherever they are. There is no um, proper re rehabilitation facility um, for them so that they could be integrated back in society. So the government, by failing to provide um, the law enforcement um, um, resources on the one hand, and of course, what I call relief facilities on the other hand, um, is failing women. A woman who's been violated, a woman who's been brutalized by her partner, um, or a woman who's been trafficked, needs different type of treatment. And the government has got no adequate facilities for that in this country at present time. In terms of talking, that they are talking about the fact that they have no adequate facilities in the country at this time, were a PPP minister, whether in this case whether it be male or female, to come to you and say, look, we don't necessarily have the money uh, to have these facilities and, and various uh, other resources to address the issues of women, how would you respond? Well, maybe the money is not there, but I'm quite sure that um, the non-governmental organizations such as the Red Tread and the help and shelter organizations um, have done tremendous work in the past and will continue to work. And they've gotten some help from international organizations. Um, but secondly, we need to cultivate better relations among boys and girls at the level of the education system, at the level of the household, in the churches, in the mandirs, in the masjids. So we need to look at it in a holistic way. It is not a criminal problem alone for police action, it is also a social problem. And we can do this by literature, by drama, by sport, by all sorts of cultural uh, means. That is why it's so disappointing that uh, after um, several years in office, the Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport has not even promulgated a proper um, program for youth. That is where it starts. Um, not only self-esteem on the part of the girl, but also you know, developing respectful relationship between young men and young women. So they grow up learning to respect one another and not exploit one another. So we need to deal with uh, the problem of gender relations in a holistic way if we are to prevent abuse when they become adults. Yeah. 
It's time, we vote in change. I say it's time, we vote in change. This year we vote in change and we also voting for unity. One people, one nation, one destiny is the place to be. Put your heads inside of the box next to the palm and key. Everybody in your country shout out up no one EFC. It's David Granger, Moses Nagamoto. On election day, we electing you. Put your ex in the box next to the palm and key. To stop nepotism, to stop cronyism, vote APNU AFC. All right, thank you very much for staying with us, of course. And the time for me to leave you is here upon us. But before I do, uh, just a couple of things. The last advertisement you saw there is reminding you about the Youths for David Granger Youth Rally this afternoon. Well, this evening, actually, that's at 6 p.m. at John and Hatfield Street outside of the White Castle Fish Shop. Come and hear from our uh, dynamic, brilliant youth who are ready to aid in de the development of our country. You know we have been uh, speaking out a lot regarding the atrocities that the PPPC in 23 years would have committed upon our youth nation, our youth environment, and we want that to stop. And that's why we are urging all young people all young people to vote a partnership for national unity alliance for, for change stay as far as possible from the cop and from the pppc they have nothing good to offer you the only thing that's in that cop are more empty promises much more empty promises and this is obvious i don't necessarily have to tell you this you can see that the People's Progressive Party Civic do not really care about the ordinary people. And just to repeat some of the sentiments of my colleague uh, last evening on his program, Mr. Christopher Jones, I want to remind you out there who are still at this time, even after all the PPPC would have done to you and would have done to this nation, even after all this time, I know some of you are still considering and you still plan to go put your ex uh, next to that ridiculous cup. But please do not do it. You can see from the ad that we would have aired uh, right before the rally ad, the, the PPPC family tree, family tree. If you are not blood related, if you're not a, a family, a crony, or a, a close friend, you have nothing to get from the People's Progressive Party civic government. Those are the facts. That's not just us telling you that. It is right there in your face. You can see it for yourself. Look at most of the, the new candidates, most of the, the youth candidates. It's, it's either someone's sister, someone's wife, someone's daughter, or someone's son. So the bottom line is, viewers, if your last name ain't Rohi, or um, uh, Anthony, or Ben, or Ramatar, you have nothing to get from the People's Progressive Party civic government. On the other hand, APNU AFC coalition, none of us, none of the youth candidates on our list are related to any of the seniors in the party. We don't. That's not a friend and family business that we're running over there. Our business is the people's business. 
we want better for all Guyanese and we're not interested in who you're related to. So that is why we're urging all young persons to be watchful, beware, please stay away from the People's Progressive Party civic government. And of course, you don't have to be arrogant or pompous about it or, or be a bully like some of their own, own, own some of their own members about it. You tell them nicely and you try and convince them, you know, to vote AP and you AFC and of course to try to save their souls at the same time because most of them, their souls need saving. So on that note, I am going to leave you today. Don't forget, come out, hear from our young, brilliant, dynamic youths in a partnership for national unity, Alliance for Change. Remember, none of us are uh, related, blood related to our superiors. There are parents in politics and we are brothers and sisters in politics, but we're not blood related. So come support the partnership, come support the coalition that has your best interest at heart. Come here from our youth speakers. Remember it's at Hatfield and John Street, 6 p.m. today, as we continue to move closely to the 2015 regional and general elections, where everyone, where we want all of you to solidly vote Partnership for National Unity, Alliance for Change. This has been Facing the Nation. Once again, thank you very much to my two guests who had to leave earlier because of our prior engagements, with Dr. Rupert Rupnarain and Mr. David Patterson. And thank you very much to those of you at home. Do join me again next week. Until then, I am Malika Ramsey. Be good to yourselves. Be good Guyanese citizens. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Goodbye. To stop nepotism, to stop cronyism, vote APNU AFC. The might of the PPP family. I am back with the PPP family. In fact, I never left. To stop nepotism, to stop cronyism, vote APNU AFC.